ever. In the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. <clears throat> During these uh, past 50 days, the church celebrates three major feasts. The resurrection is when our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And during a period of 40 days after his resurrection, he passed his teachings to the disciples, of the sacraments, the liturgy, <clears throat> salvation, and other things. And on the 40th day from his resurrection, the church celebrates the Feast of the Ascension. This is when our Lord Jesus Christ told the disciples that he will ascend and send them the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. And on the 50th day from the resurrection, the Holy Spirit descended to the disciples and others in the Feast of Pentecost. <clears throat> now, as we reflect on, on the, the liturgical year, we think about Christmas and we think about, we know that Christmas is a celebration of God taking flesh and becoming one of us. And we can say that the Feast of Pentecost is the celebration of God choosing to dwell in us. St. Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 when he says, For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Unfortunately, we can go about our lives and forget about the amazing gifts that we have been given. We can choose to obscure the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit is not some, some magical gift. It's, it's a personal encounter with the person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit of God is given to us by His grace, not because of, we deserve it. And although this is the case, there are certain dispositions and certain attitudes that will allow God to magnify His grace within us. There are certain things that we must do in order to cultivate uh, the grace of the Holy Spirit within us. Without this type of cultivation, we're going to be left with a gift that's a seed that cannot put down roots and cannot uh, sprout and bear fruit, unfortunately. What separates the saints from, from people like me, um, the people of God, is their ability to work with the Holy Spirit to allow the gifts to be magnified and to be multiplied in their lives. Pentecost, like Basca, is like Passover, was a, a feast of the Jews. And they celebrated Pentecost 50 days after they celebrated the Passover. It commemorated the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, we know that God never does anything by accident. Our Lord rose in conjunction with the Passover precisely because it is a Passover from death to life. And so the Holy Spirit is given to the world for the church on Pentecost because it is the fulfillment of the law. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. But what Pentecost is giving um, and the giving of the Holy Spirit does is this. By fulfilling the law, it takes something that was external, um, that which was an external code of conduct, if you will, uh, a code of behavior, and makes it internal. No longer is it something that we carve on tablets and put it in the front of our courthouses, but after Pentecost, it is something that, that comes to live within us, shaping our vision, shaping our lives, shaping our entire concept of what it is to live. For example, that's why our Lord in, in the Gospel of St. Matthew when he's teaching his disciples, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, that's part of the external law, right? But he says further, but I say unto you, any man who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. Okay, now it's become internal. It's not a checklist that's external to us. It's something which is supposed to shape how we look at the world. So the external law becomes written on their hearts, not on tablets of stone, but on flesh. So this is one thing that happens in Pentecost. Another thing that happens uh, when we contemplate on Pentecost, sending the Holy Spirit from the Father to us was the last thing that he had to do to equip us to live the life of the kingdom in his church in this world. 
This is why he returned. Some people say, well, why did he have to go back? Why couldn't he just stay? Why did he return to the presence of his father in the heavens? And the fact is, he had done so. He has done everything that he was supposed to do. There was nothing more for him to do other than sending the Holy Spirit from his father to us, to equip us for the lives that we have been called to live. So his job is now to stand before the throne of his father in heaven and to continually offer himself to God on our behalf always, 24-7. So in our Lord Jesus Christ, heaven and earth are rejoined. In our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the power, we have the guidance, we have the direction to return to the presence of our Father in heaven, in his kingdom. This is why we come together to celebrate this Mass, this Eucharist, this liturgy, however you want to name it. It is something in which we join in the sharing of Christ's sacrifice of himself, his self-offering. So we join that with him in heaven. What happens here doesn't happen in Chino Hills, California. What happens here doesn't happen in Cairo, Egypt, for example. Because when we come together, joining Christ in the presence of his Father in heaven, we ascend into heaven. And heaven and earth meet. In Chino Hills, California, heaven and earth meets. In Cairo, Egypt, heaven and earth meet. Wherever faithful Orthodox Christians come before the altar of God to join their offering with Christ's self-offering of himself, heaven and earth meet. It's an amazing thing if you really think about it. But the only thing that allows us to join in that is, of course, the power and the grace of God's Holy Spirit. Now, people have had contact with the Holy Spirit of God prior to Pentecost. I think sometimes we get this idea, you know, that the Spirit wasn't present. And that's just not true. At the creation, as an example, we are reminded in Genesis that the Spirit of the Lord moved across the face of the water. And the, the acts of the Holy Trinity are always present. They're acts of three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son, of course, is the Word incarnate. And he shows us the Father. It is as close to seeing God, the Father, in humanity that you will ever get to see in human form. But the Holy Spirit does not, and, it, and that makes it harder for us to get a handle on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, our Lord tells us, blows where it will. We can't control the Holy Spirit of God. We'd like to. We try to. We can't capture the dove and cage it, although we try all the time. We try to get the Holy Spirit to do things that we want to do, as if we had a bird that we were trying to train. There's a, a bad joke. But it says, you know, he is the paraclete, not the parakeet. He is not a trainable bird. The Holy Spirit carries out God's will wherever he is sent to do that. And sometimes he does that in a way that is uncomfortable. But the fact is that now that the Son has returned to the presence of his Father, and the Holy Spirit shapes the apostles in that upper room, and all the faithful into his actual body so that we make up that body. Remember, the apostles that celebrate the Pentecost here, you heard in the readings, the apostles see our Lord Jesus Christ depart from, from them and he returns to heaven. And, you know, they're kind of like, well, I'll wait. I'll wait for you to come back. I wonder what that means. And finally, a couple of angels have to say, guys, focus. Why are you standing there looking up into heaven? This, is, this same Jesus who ascended will return. Your job, and he gave you a job, is to go back to Jerusalem and wait to be empowered from on high. 
So they do that. And you have this period of 10 days that we just concluded with today between the Ascension and the day of Pentecost, that it comes after the Feast of Ascension, in which they go back a lot happier than they were, for example, on Good Friday. And after Good Friday, they assumed it was all over. It was almost like they were conned, and you know, their heart felt like they were tricked. Whatever it might have been until they have encountered the risen Lord. But they go back happier men, but perhaps still nervous. They were still the ones in hiding because they were afraid that they were going to be identified as being with Christ, that kind of thing. But it's on Pentecost when they receive conviction, when they receive confidence, when they receive focus and courage, and the power to take what they had experienced, an experience of the risen Lord, who they knew personally, and to go out and to begin to tell people about him. It's an amazing thing. Peter, a fisherman, stands up in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Remember, this is a Jewish feast. So the Jews were already gathered together to celebrate the day of Pentecost. He stands up on the day of Pentecost and begins to talk to them about Jesus and the coming of the Spirit. And at the end of all this, he speaks so powerfully that, that he says to them, This Jesus whom you crucified. Can you imagine? Such a bold statement. It's the same person who ran and hid. The same person who denied Christ three times. Standing up and proclaiming to his people that the Messiah had come. That the Spirit had come, and he speaks so powerfully, and to our knowledge, this was the first time maybe he has done so, that the people were struck at the heart. They were cut to the heart, it says. And they said, what, must we, what can we do? What should we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. This group of men who are basically, essentially, uh, followers of, of this traveling rabbi who they were really attached to suddenly no longer had a leader except God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit that Jesus had sent. And they themselves, therefore, spread out as far as they could go. We know Thomas got as far as India. <clears throat> Others went north, west. All of them, all of them, except for John the Evangelist, died as martyrs. All of them had a tremendous impact wherever they went. They had the power to proclaim what before they were frightened to say. So the Holy Spirit shapes them completely into the church and empowers them to be leaders of that church and empowers all faithful believers to do so. Our, pen our personal Pentecost happens and begins in baptism and chrismation, but the renewal of the gift of the Holy Spirit cannot come without a deep struggle. It doesn't happen passively. It's a determination. It's a, it's a choice from your heart, an acknowledgement of our sinful condition, an acknowledgement of our distance from God. This point is not simply one that we remember on the day of and the Feast of Pentecost, but it's something that we should remember each and every day. God is not limited to working only on the feast days. He is ready to work every day when he, and he desires to be with us and dwell within us. He is looking for a suitable place to dwell, and that place is the heart that is softened by a real and genuine heartfelt presence. And we should ask ourselves, when is the last time that I prayed with genuine tears? Do I have to pray with tears? No. And if not with tears, when is the last time that I prayed from the depth of my heart? That's why prayer can't be passive. Prayer can't be on the way to work, in the car, with a lot of distractions around us. It can't be something that's going to happen if I have time to get to it. 
has to be from the depths of our heart. We understand that God is waiting patiently to have communion with us. And we have to be careful not to neglect our part of the equation, although it's such a small part. Humility is the answer. St. Anthony said, I saw the snares that the enemy spreads out over the world, and I said, groaning, how can one get through such snares? And I heard a voice saying to me, humility. So we start with humility by looking at ourselves seriously. Seriously. Another father said, seek God daily, but seek him in your heart, not outside of it. But in order to find God, become humble as dust before the Lord. For the Lord abhors the proud, whereas he visits those who are humble in heart. Wherefore he says, to whom will I look? But to him that is meek and humble in heart. The Holy Spirit loves us. He wants to inflame our hearts with his love. God has come to us to dwell in us. But our, we have to ask ourselves, is our heart prepared to make the space of this living water? So to conclude, we can't take the Holy Spirit and nail it down. He is giving to us the uncreated light of God, communicating to us the life of the kingdom of heaven, communicating to us whatever gifts God knows that we need. And different people have different gifts. So as homework, I would suggest we read the book of Galatians. And we read about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We look at the last chapter where, there, where he talks about love and friendship, patience and repentance, self-control, the spirit of self-control. The Holy Spirit himself is a person as much as our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. But it's a different kind of experience. The Spirit blows where he will, and he comes to us in whatever we need. St. Paul tells us in, in the book of Romans that if we cannot find the words to pray, that the Spirit himself will pray with us, sighs and groanings that are greater than words. We don't even pray on our own, and we don't realize it. The Holy Spirit of God prays through us and supports us. And he supports the words that we send up unto God. And the Holy Spirit, above all things, is always renewing us and his holy church. The historic church was not something that exists in the past. The historic church is now, right here in Chino Hills, California. This is the same church with the same teachings, but more than that, it's the same personal encounter with a personal God that transformed the lives of 12 and transformed the lives of all those who had heard him, who transforms the lives of all those who respond to his presence in our midst. Pentecost marks the end of many things liturgically. Salvation is completed through the Holy Spirit coming to us. The end of the feasts of the liturgical year comes to an end, the Coptic year. And for the same reason, it's a celebration of a beginning. It's the birthday of the church. The presence among us of the Holy Spirit. And this new life in Christ of grace, of knowledge, <clears throat> of holiness. It's a new service. This is why we start the Apostle Fast tomorrow empowered from the Holy Spirit. We start the work. It's a time of service. It's a time of mission. It's a time of preaching. And so our annual celebration of Pentecost is a reminder, us, is a reminder to us all of our all-important responsibility to be good stewards of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And glory be to God forever. Amen. The Spirit.